All right, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all this morning. Um, I enjoy that video. I must confess, I might really enjoy the one where all of you are saying the creed even better. It was just so much fun to see all of the different people in the church um, reciting that statement of Christian faith and to see the children do it. So both videos are great, but it was just a delight for my soul to see especially the children recite parts of the creed in the video last week. Congratulations to Vanessa and her family on the baptism. So excited. We rejoice with you. Thank God for you. Uh, excellent job, Pastor uh, Jonathan Felix as well. So we rejoice uh, just as guests in this baptism that you've had today. This is my last Sunday with you, as you know. Enjoy. <laughs> well, thank you. I've enjoyed. I appreciate that. Uh, enjoyed being with all of you. It's been a great time. Uh, this is a sermon series that was constructed long before I came as a guest, the sermon series Through the Apostles' Creed. We've just looked at key aspects of Christian teaching by walking our way through this old, ancient Christian confession. And today we come to the very end of the creed. And the last line of the creed simply says this, we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And this is honestly, well, I suppose you're not supposed to have favorites in terms of what you like in the creed. It's all good. But if I were to pick, this is my personal favorite because I think this is the most encouraging part of the creed because this is the point to which all of our gospel hope is directed. We confess that 2,000 years ago, a man, Jesus of Nazareth, was more than a man, that he lived that he died, but crucially, he rose again. And because he rose again, one day we will rise in a similar fashion. And all of the Christian experience in this life until we get to glory is pointed toward this hope. This is what this is all about. God has never promised any of us an easy, safe passage through this life. Jesus said himself, in this world, you will have trouble. And we can all say amen to that. I've never been to a church where someone said, well, not me, Pastor, I've had no trouble. <laughs> right? We all, all say, yes, amen, in this world we've had trouble. Financial, personal, relational, work-related, health. And let us be frank, the older we get, sometimes it feels as though the amount of trouble increases. But the hope is this. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but remember what he said next? Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. He's resurrected. And so we're not promised safe passage in this life, but we are promised hope in this life. And the hope is pointing toward this resurrection reality. And so that's why the creed ends on this positive statement. And that's what we want to look at today. We're reading this morning from 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll be looking at verses 50 to 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. And while you turn, I'll just uh, give a little bit of context here. In this passage, Paul is explaining the importance of the resurrection and the truthfulness of the resurrection. Because strange as it may seem today, there were people in the church at Corinth to whom he is writing who denied the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. So they were in the church body, they were professing themselves to be followers of Jesus, but they were saying that Jesus did not raise from the dead, or at least did not raise from the dead in the way the Gospels have presented his resurrection. And so all of 1 Corinthians 15 is Paul defending the resurrection, explaining the resurrection, and pointing us toward the hope of the resurrection. And these final verses in this chapter really capture that idea of hope so well. Paul says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together as a church briefly. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that we have in the resurrection, that the Son of God, by the mighty working of your hand, raised from the dead on the third day, and that we can celebrate his resurrection even today through the event of baptism, which symbolizes the death, burial, but then resurrection, that we can share in by being united with Christ. And today, as we come to uncover this passage, I pray that you and you alone would be glorified, that this would be about you and not us, and that you would guide us and direct us in all truth by your word and by your spirit. We trust this time into your hands, into your care, for your glory, your name's sake. And we pray this in your name. Amen. What I want to do this morning is what we've often done together on these Sunday mornings. We're just going to kind of walk through this passage. I'll make some explanatory notes. And then as we go through, I'll gesture and point toward other verses in the Bible that develop these ideas in even greater detail. And I'll just note by saying, Paul makes a dramatic statement at the beginning of the verses, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, perishable does not inherit the imperishable. All that means is that we, right now, in our current states, cannot be in the presence of the Lord in terms of glory. Now God is with us, to be sure, in this life, as we pray, and as we meet in church, and as we sing hymns to Him. But in terms of us being in the presence of the Lord in glory, well, none of us in our current condition can, uh, can have access to Him. Well, here's why. We are, as Paul says here, very perishable. We're filled with our sinful nature. Even as Christians, we still have a sinful desire at times. We can still do sinful things at times. And we don't have a glorified body. We have bodies that can get hurt. We have bodies that suffer arthritis. We have bodies that can suffer stroke or dementia. We have all sorts of issues that we face in this life. And none of us are immune from any of those issues. And God in His glory, well, says that He wants us, and He wants us to be with Him, but not like we are now. And the good news is that God in His grace is in the process and one day will transform us into something far more glorious than we are now so that we can be with Him, so that we can enjoy Him, and as the Bible words it in Hebrews, so that we can enter into rest with Him. When this difficult life, when this life of trial and temptation and struggle is over, we enter into His rest. And we do that by discarding the perishable and becoming imperishable. That's the key. Well, how does that work? Well, this is something only God can do. It's not something we do. This is a gracious work of God in our lives. And Paul says this happens at the very end of time when Christ returns. So look at verse 51. I will tell you a mystery. Now when Paul uses the word mystery, he doesn't mean something that's hard to understand 
or something that's like some sort of secret knowledge that only the elite can know. When he says mystery, he has in mind something that has previously not been revealed in God's uh, outworking in salvation history. This is something that people up until this point did not know. But Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he's writing, is now making this new information known to us. So that's what mystery means. It's not like it's complex secret in the sense of only a few can get it. It's that it was concealed and it's now revealed. The mystery is disclosed. Now it's open for us to consider and preach about and talk about. And the mystery, what's now being revealed for the first time is this. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, I once preached as a, at a church, as a guest pastor, that had this verse above the nursery on a sign. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. All right. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I just had to slip that in there because it has stuck with me, and I think about it every time. But in all seriousness, what does this mean? Well, Paul, when he mentions sleep, He's using there a euphemism for death. In the Bible, when Christians die, Paul describes them as going to sleep. Why? Because death is not permanent for a Christian. We live again. We don't really die as dying in terms of a completion process or a cessation of life. If you're a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Paul is using a euphemism here for the death of the Christian. Because for the Christian, there is life after death. So he describes it as if one is going to sleep, peacefully laying the body down. So we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed means this. When Jesus comes back, some Christians in the faith will have already died. They are the ones who have gone to sleep before us. Other Christians, when Jesus comes back, will have not died yet. They will be alive and awake and alert on earth at his return. But whether we have gone to sleep in the Lord, whether we've died in the Lord, or whether we're awake, when Jesus comes back, all Christians will be changed. All Christians will be changed from going from being perishable to imperishable, from living a life of corruption to incorruptibility. So either way, we're covered and safe in God's hands. We don't have to worry, well, what happens if I miss it? What happens if God comes for other people and God doesn't do anything for me? No. No. All Christians, whether they've gone to sleep or they're alive, they will be changed. And this change, this transformation from corruptibility to incorruptibility happens instantly. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Radical transformation. Radical change. And this is the hope that we're waiting for. There is hope. In this life, thank God, because of the many medical advances that we benefit from, and we thank God for all of the doctors and nurses and scientists who work to make these advances possible and accessible. So there is hope that can be had in this life for a number of cases where we can receive treatment in hospitals from doctors. We thank God for that. But the ultimate hope is that wherever you are in this life and whatever you're facing in this life, there will be one day a final and ultimate cure for all of us. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And we're all going to be changed. So the trumpet will sound. Christ is returning as the trumpet is sounding. And then notice what happens next. This is what Paul's doing as he's revealing this mystery. This is his outlining of this process of transformation. The dead will be raised and we will be changed. So the dead in Christ, those who've fallen asleep, they're going to be present. They'll be 
present and alive and awake and alert. And as they're present, alive and awake and alert, the transformation will happen. We will all be changed, all Christians becoming imperishable. And Paul says it like this in 53. It's sort of like putting on a new pair of clothes. The perishable body will put on the imperishable. The mortal body will put on immortality. And so this transformation that's instant would just be like putting on this new state of existence as we go from corruptibility to incorruptibility. Now, here's the question that I've always had when I've read this text. What in the world does this look like in real life? What does it mean to go from corruptibility to incorruptibility as if you're putting on a new clothes, putting on this new manner of existence all at one moment? When the dead are there and the alive are there, Christ is there, the trumpet's sounding, what does this look like? What does this mean? And this is where Christian theology can help us. And so if you'll let me, I just want to walk through a couple of key ideas in the Bible that do emerge from 1 Corinthians 15, this entire chapter, not just these verses, but also just other parts of the Bible. So we can construct an account of this that's biblically based. And here is where I want to begin. And this is in no way a trick question. When God made Adam and Eve, did he make them as physical and as spiritual creatures? That is, they had a soul and a body. Yes. Right? So Adam and Eve in the garden, at the very beginning, before there is sin, before there is corruption, they're made in God's image, and that can mean a lot of things and does mean a lot of things. But as far as we can tell from the Bible, there is something in humanity called a soul. It's not physical. But also we know as humans we have bodies. That is to inhabit a physical existence, to be embodied. And here's the key. God said that that state of affairs, to be a human, body and soul, was very good. All right? This is how God made us. He said that's very good. So it's not a bad thing to be a human being in a body. This is how God made us to be. This is how we're supposed to be. Now, after sin enters the world, there is corruption. And now, we do experience death. And our bodies do wear and decay and move toward the grave. And I'm not trying to be pessimistic here, but let's just be honest. That is what human life is after the fall of Adam and Eve, is our bodies are continually pressing onward toward death. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> it's just the truth. We know it. There was a time... When David Rathel had hair. Right? That time is becoming further and further back in the past. Because my body is transforming itself as I age. And as I age, it's moving towards some sort of end point. I would like Jesus to come back before that end point comes. But at least 1 Corinthians tells me I'm good either way. Right? So our bodies are in this process. Now here's another question. When Jesus comes to the earth, when God the Son comes to the earth, takes on human flesh, does he take on all that it means to be a human? Yes. He's fully God, but he adds to himself now all that it means to be fully human. So Jesus on this earth had flesh and bones like we do. He had human emotions like we do. He could grieve. Remember, he wept over his friend Lazarus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's crying out in prayer, in agony in prayer. There are times in the Gospels he's a person of joy. And it seems to me when I read the Gospels, he actually would have been kind of fun to hang out with because he's just always doing these different things. He's a person of great action. He's fully one of us. So he's fully God, but he comes fully human as well. 
So as he experiences death on the cross, he dies as a man. He sheds his blood, he cries out in agony and pain, and he breathes his last breath. But when he raises from the grave, does he raise just as a ghost, as a phantom? No. He rises from the grave, watch this now, body and soul. That's the key to Jesus' resurrection. He's not coming out of the grave as some sort of immaterial, ghost-like phantom creature, some sort of hologram that looked like Jesus, but he's really now just light or uh, a floating uh, spirit. When Jesus raised from the dead, he rose from the dead in a glorified body. And that's why, do you remember when he's talking to his disciples and Thomas says, hey, unless I can see and unless I can touch, I will not believe. And Jesus says, well, you can touch right here. A ghost does not have flesh and blood that I have. Now he's identifying himself as having flesh and blood after his resurrection after his crucifixion. He rises physically. He arises bodily. It's just a glorified body. That's why if you've ever noticed in the Gospels, after his resurrection, he sits down and breaks bread and even eats fish. Look in, look in Luke and John, and he's eating to show them how physical he is. He's in a physical world He's a physical, glorified Christ, and he's interacting with this physical world, and he's eating. And by the way, I'll just mention in Revelation, when we get to glory, it says that we will eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, amen to that. <laughs> and so, here's where I'm going. We have to abandon any notion that these texts are about us getting rid of our bodies. We have to abandon the notion that whatever it means to be incorruptible and imperishable, and whatever it means to lay aside corruption and lay aside perishableness, entails that we get rid of our bodies or we get rid of physical existence and we become like just ghosts or spirits. Because to be a human is to be body and soul, and God said that's very good. And when Jesus rose from the dead, He arose from the dead, yes, He's full deity, but he rose from the dead full humanity, just glorified humanity. And the Bible says, when he appears, we shall be like him. The Bible says that his resurrection is the first fruits of the resurrection that all of us will enjoy at the end of time. So it's the model, it's the template He's the one who goes before. So when Paul says here, the imperishable will now be put on, he's talking about at the end of time when the trumpet sounds, we will have glorified bodies similar to Christ's glorified body. That's what it means. And they will be bodies. They will still be physical. They will be bodies. Jesus' body was physical. But it was glorified. His suffering was done. He's now entered in this state of exaltation. And so it will be for us as we're sharing in the life that he gives us. And so at the end of time, Paul makes the point, did you notice to say this? In verse 51, let's look at it again. I will tell you the mystery. We'll not all sleep. We will all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable. See, if you add in this component of physicalness, that verse makes sense. He's not just saying that the dead will be there like floating and hovering as souls. The dead will be raised. He's talking about people coming out of the grave. He's talking about people coming out of the grave because they're receiving glorified bodies. And so Christianity has always taught, when it's got its theology right, and it's said this for years and years and years, that the body you and I have now is the body that we'll be in forever. Now, if that discourages you, don't worry, it, it will be glorified. 
All right. You too, one day, when you get your glorified body, will be bald like I am. I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, that's what I tell myself. But we will keep these bodies. We will have these bodies. It's not like we lay down who we are or what we are. It's this. God saves us to the utmost. He saves us body and soul. He saves all that there is to us. And so it's not about you laying down part of you or you not being you anymore. It's you being a glorified you. It's really you and I becoming who we're supposed to be and who we were meant to be originally. It's us becoming real and having life to the fullness for the first time. So we will have these bodies, but these bodies will be changed. These bodies will be glorified. We'll rise from the dead if we were dead when Christ returns. Or if we're alive when Christ returns, the bodies will just be transformed instantly. But either way, we will have these bodies, they will change, and they will now be glorified. They'll now be incorruptible bodies. They'll now be imperishable bodies. And we will live with the Lord in the presence of the Lord like that forever. And that's why Revelation at the end of the Bible has all of this imagery of us being in a physical place. The new heavens and the new earth. In a physical place. The new Jerusalem. In a physical place where there are all these descriptions of the beauty of that city. And the fruit from the tree is there. The tree of life. And the river is there. The river mentioned in the Garden of Eden. Rivers. That's why Revelation paints a physical portrayal of glory. It's because we will be physical people, glorified physical people, living in a glorified new heavens and earth. And the Christian creed says this, the resurrection of the body. That's what the creed says. It doesn't just say resurrection. It says the resurrection of the body. So you will always be you. Just a glorified you. A glorified you. A glorified me. It's no longer susceptible to temptation. A glorified you and a glorified me that's no longer beholden to arthritis or cancer or not being able to remember the things we used to be able to remember. We will be ourselves and have life to the fullness. Now, before I taught, I was a pastor. And so I spent so many times in hospitals, and people would say, you know, I'm just praying God heals me. I'm just praying God heals my mom or my grandma. And we pray, and, and we don't always see answers to our prayers, and we worry and we wonder. And what I always came back to is, well, God will. God will. And it may not be right now, but if they're in Christ, He will. Because anyone who's had dementia or Alzheimer's or arthritis, anyone who had permanent disability in terms of some sort of health condition that's left them unable to do things that they did before, before they have that condition, Anyone who's suffered greatly in this life or who's seen family suffer knows that one day all of that perishability, perishableness, if we could call it that, will be laid aside. And we will put on glory like we're putting on a new pair of clothes. And all of that will be gone. All of that will be done. And we will be putting on incorruptibility. And so God does and He will heal. All of our praying was not in vain. It's all pointing to this moment when the trumpet sounds and God says, here is the answer we've all been waiting for. That's the hope we have. And this is the hope that Christians have always had. Years ago, I've told you before, weeks ago, in the Roman Empire, the Christians made the radical decision to bury their dead under the ground, under the cities, in the catacombs. And the reason they did that was because they knew this passage and passages like it were in the Bible, the resurrection of the body. That their loved ones, their brothers and sisters in Christ, their family who are in Christ, 
We're going to bury them because these people are coming back one day. We'll see them again when the trumpet sounds. And sometimes, and yes, this is going to be as weird or as gross as it sounds at first. Sometimes when the church was facing persecution, they would meet underground in the catacombs with the dead so they would worship with them to remind themselves of the hope that they were looking forward to. So they're being persecuted. They're struggling. How did they find hope? Well, death is temporary, but life goes on. To give us hope in the midst of our suffering, we're going to go down where our brothers and sisters are, worship with them knowing we will see them again in glorified bodies. That's what they did to give themselves hope. So the resurrection of the body. This is what we teach and preach. So Christianity is not a pie-in-the-sky religion about escaping this world and throwing off reality. No, it's a, it's a religion. It's a faith. It's truth that's very much grounded in reality. It acknowledges up front the difficulties and hardships of this life. It just says that this life will be transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the trumpet sounds. So it's this life changed dramatically. That's what we believe. And Paul says when all of this happens, when we lay aside perishability and pick up imperishability, then the Old Testament promise is fulfilled that says this at the end of verse 54 and the start of verse 55. Death is swallowed in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Now, these are quotations from several Old Testament passages. But here's what I love. This is a taunt song to death. Now, I'm from the South, as you know. And there are a lot of churches in the South. But if the South has a religion, it's probably college football. Just the truth. <laughs> a lot of churches, but if there's a religion, it's college sports. And there are a lot of taunt songs in college football. Some of them can be said behind this pulpit. Some of them should not be said. <laughs> Some of them are more inappropriate than others. Some of them, I, I would never say that. But it's part of the rivalry of these games where people will mock the other team, mock their rival. I think about that every time I come to this passage because this is a mocking song directed toward death. Death, where is your victory? You did not get me, Christ won. Death, where is your sting? You did not harm me, Christ won. It's not arrogance, it's about us rejoicing in the Lord and celebrating in the Lord. For our entire lives, let's be honest, every single one of us have been afraid of dying. You know how I know that? Because hardly any of us actually think about it until we have to. If you're like me, you just have this implicit thing in your mind where you go to a funeral, but you never envision it as your own. I'm not trying to be graphic. There's a disconnect, right? We don't think about our own end unless we're forced to by circumstance or health or whatever. We just assume we're just going to keep going. We don't want to be confronted with the reality of death. And that shows you how afraid we all are of it. Hebrews talks about this, the book of Hebrews. Spending our entire lives in slavery to the fear of death. To paraphrase the verse. The death, death that cost us separation in our family, in grief when we had to bury loved ones and friends and family. Death that kept us up at night. Death, this force that we were afraid of our entire lives. Death will one day be no more. It's going to be defeated. And this enemy that was oppressing us and calling our family and friends away far too soon will be defeated to the point that we can stand up and mock it to its face. You have no power over me anymore. You have no power over me. Because Christ is risen, I was brought to life too. Because Christ was risen by the Father, 
I'm now alive too. It's from Him that I have this life. And even though I wept at funerals and I wept and wept at home after the funeral service ended, I am not weeping anymore. That's the reality. So this thing that oppressed us is now mocked by us. And I think about this a lot at funerals. I think about this a lot in hard times. Because every one of us has been touched by these realities that I'm describing. And I just think, well, one day, Lord, this grief will turn to joy. Joy that's so powerful that I'll have so much celebration, I can, I can mock death. It won't be like this forever. And so this is the hope we have. So to sum up what we've said so far, bodily resurrection. We have a glorified body that will be like Jesus' glorified body. That gives us great hope because death is defeated. Now notice where Paul goes at the end, verse 58. In light of all of these things, my brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In light of what's coming, in light of what's going to transpire one day when the trumpet sounds, you just be faithful now while we're in this condition where there is suffering and difficulty. You be immovable now because it's not going to be like this forever. God's just calling us to be faithful until He returns. And I love the encouragement here that what we're doing in Him is not in vain. Why is it not in vain? Well, because our life continues after this, this life. And all the things that we did for the Lord that nobody else noticed, well, God saw. And in our glorified state, God will recognize that. He's faithful. He's not unjust. All the suffering that we might have endured that no one else knew about, God knew about. He's faithful. He's just. And so it's because we know life continues where God is fair and gracious that we know all that we do is not in vain. So just be immovable. Have hope. Have confidence even in the dark times. Walk in the light even though the days are evil because none of this is in vain. Years ago, I heard this story. It was passed down to me by an old preacher who trained me on preaching, well, let's just say a long time ago. I don't want to give the years. <laughs> he said he was invited to preach at a very, very rural church. And this rural church had an old cemetery next to it. So he preached the funeral service at the church. He preached a graveside service at the end of that funeral. And then as the people were leaving, he was a person interested in history. So he decided to walk around that cemetery just to see the dates on the tombstones. He was just curious about the age of the place and the sort of names that would be there on the tombstones. And he goes back into the oldest part of the cemetery, to the oldest part of the church property, and the graves there had been weathered down by the rain and the weather, the elements. Uh, they'd been beaten down. The names were not always legible because they'd been there for so many years. Uh, you know, and you've seen cemeteries like this. The grass had grown up high. Uh, there were even bushes and trees that were starting to grow up. It was unkept. So he's pushing back bushes to see dates and trying to read the dates. And then he comes to this one tombstone where the name had been beaten away by the wind and the rain and the elements. And all that was left was just a scriptural verse. So we don't even know who this person is anymore. God does, but we don't. But all that was was a scriptural verse. And it was 1 Corinthians 15, the end of 51. We will not all sleep. We will all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the trumpet. And his point in telling us that story was this. Life calls us all to be weathered down. But what's permanent, what's fixed, is that the trumpet will sound. And so throughout life, the one constant 
that gives us the ability to be immovable is that reality. The trumpet will sound. And this person, whoever this was, was so confident of that reality, they etched it in stone so that everyone else can see it. And even though that person's name was probably lost to time, their faith was still there, etched in stone. That part had not been removed yet. And that's an illustration for how we should be. All of us at some point, if Christ doesn't come, will probably be forgotten by many people. All of us at some point, all of our difficulties, all of our struggles, they will one day end. But the trumpet is the reality that we're waiting for. And that's supposed to be etched on our heart. That's what allows us to be immovable. So whatever you're facing, whatever I'm facing, think about that, and that's the strength. That's what makes us immovable. So we believe, as the Creed says, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We thank God for the hope. Well, let's pray together. And as we pray, if you're here today, you've never trusted in Christ, you can pray to receive Him today. God loves you. God wants you to know that He loves you. We can say that with confidence. That's what the Bible says. And if you turn to Him, you enter into a relationship in which uh, there is no death. There is the passing on to a new, greater life to come. Because God wants the fellowship with you and His people to continue on. So if you've never trusted in Christ, Come to Him today. Repent of your sins. Ask God to forgive you. Turn to Jesus in salvation. And if you have questions, ask the pastors here, the elders here. But if you are a Christian, let's all pray together, all of us, that we would be immovable, professing not just with our minds but with our hearts that we believe in the resurrection and the life everlasting. Father, we thank You for today. We thank You for salvation. God, life is filled with difficulty and trials. Help us to have an eternal perspective behind all of it. Help us to have confidence and hope even in dark times. And help us to walk before you with faith and confidence, knowing that you are good and that you do have blessings for us. Help us to, to do the things that sometimes seem impossible with, with you or they're not impossible. Help us to be patient, loving, charitable, steadfast, unwavering until you return. We pray this in your name.